Many years uh, ago, I wrote this piece called uh, What is Sustainability? And uh, I'll just give you the short version of it. Sustainability is not like, uh, it's, not a, it's not an end. It's not a place you go to. It's not the golden cow. It's, it's, it's a discipline. It's a, it's a way of being where you just get better and better and better at living in your place and kind of surrendering to the fact that you're infinitely small in a place you know nothing about and nothing about that will ever change and just completely living in that space, building your discipline around that. Hey folks, what's happening? Welcome to Your Forest. My name is Matthew Kristoff, and on this podcast, we talk about the environment and the science of sustainability. Now, the last two episodes have been about old growth, mostly coastal old growth in BC and that kind of thing, and you know our connection to them emotionally and the actual ecosystems and learning about them and that kind of stuff. Uh, this is the last one in the old growth series that just happened serendipitously and uh we go really deep into the policy into the the mind shift change the the paradigm shift that needs to happen for our society to get its head wrapped around ecosystem-based management and to have that conversation who else do you talk to but gary merkel he's been on before uh gary is a member of tall tan first nations he is a registered professional forester in bc and he's the lead guy behind this whole old growth paradigm shift thing he's just uh he's an independent contractor he's kind of the the moderator mediator he's the middle guy he's the guy that everyone has to trust the guy that has the vision and sees what's going on and i think i've decided to nickname him gary the guru merkel because uh, that's just the role he's taken on (laughs) and so he's he's a fantastic balanced perspective uh a very just a very refreshing view on understanding how all of the pressures on the forest come together and all the pressures of society come together to create something that's really difficult to to sort out and see the future of but gary's able to do that and he's able to see a clear path and he's able to to push us in the right direction and so that's why he's on today we go deep and it was awesome. Uh, Gary is just so wise. I love it. Uh, yeah. So that's today's episode. Sponsors for 2023. Uh, West Fraser is the number one sponsor for 2023. I would not be able to do this without them. So thank you, West Fraser, for all of your support over the years. It's been fantastic. I can't wait to uh, to keep that up. And uh, GreenLink Forestry has another sponsor. The only other sponsor. Been with me since the beginning. Couldn't ever have done this without GreenLink. So thank you, GreenLink, for all your support. All right, without any further messing around, let's dive into this conversation with Gary, talking old growth, talking a paradigm shift in forest management, landscape management in Western society, and uh, the mind shift that needs to happen for this to, to be a reality. He thinks it's possible, and he thinks it's happening, and I think I do too. Here we go. I was thinking before we dive deep into the discussion around the paradigm shift that we discussed last time and what's happening in forest management in British Columbia, I think we should do a quick rundown of the old growth review, the strategic review that you and Al Gorley did um, and kind of explain to people that may not have, I mean, it was a few years ago now we recorded that first episode. Uh, I think right. we should do a quick rundown of what, what the strategic review was that you and Al Gorley did and some of the the outcomes or the suggestions that it had before we get into the progress that has taken place since then. Sure. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. So Al and I, um, Al Gorley and I were asked by the British Columbia cabinet to go and uh, to do a review of how we manage our old growth forests in British Columbia 
with a particular emphasis on the science and management aspects of it. I mean, obviously, when you look at something like this, you have to consider political dimensions as well, but you, you, it was more intended to be, and what do we need to do to fix this system? Right. Al and I went out and talked to, um, I don't know, thousands of people, a few hundred meetings. In fact, actually, this was one of those topics that almost everybody has an opinion on. And when you look at the sum, when you look at the total input that we got during that review, the amount of input, the metrics of the input, the total of that totaled more than every other review before that combined. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just say it's yeah. not a small task. They're like, hey, hey, uh, Al, Gary, you guys mind uh, fixing what we got going on over here? And you're like, yeah, yeah, sure. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> well, yeah. And, you know, everybody's got an opinion and it's a strong opinion. It's, you know, I said to, I've said to a few people, it's a bit like abortion in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously a different whole scale of discussion, but everybody's got an opinion. It's a and lightning rod, you, yeah. Generally a strong opinion, one way or the other, whatever it yep. is. So we went and talked to British Columbia. Well, maybe I should just speak first to the input that we got. What people said to us is, we don't like the way our forests are being managed. Mm -hmm. We don't think it's sustainable in the long run, and it's compromising too many other values. And that came from all sectors, um, you know, maybe not exactly all of that message, but those in general. And and frankly, we don't get enough say in it, anything. It's always other people doing it to us as opposed to doing talking to us and working with us. Right. So we heard that across the board from industry, from Engos, from First Nations, from municipal governments, from regular public, from forest workers, from... The list is almost endless of the people that provided in, input to us. And we had a project manager and our instructions to him were make sure, you know, we can't speak to everybody who wants to talk to us, but make sure you get a really good sampling of every kind of group across the province. And so, I mean, we went and talked to school kids a couple of times. Uh, we do, just the, the, the breadth was incredible. Yeah. Anyways, having said all that, the, the common message was we need to change. Yeah. And what Al and I recognized fairly quickly was this, this is not a technical problem. It is an issue with the way that we see for us and the way that we view them and manage them. And it has resulted in a system that looks at forests as simply trees, as commodities, and doesn't yeah. really focus on the ecosystem itself, gotcha. um, a, a core understanding of land management, which is something, frankly, that a lot of foresters don't learn really well, is that the forest is not the ecosystem. The forest is the product of the ecosystem. The ecosystem is the whole environment, all of the species together, the relationships between those, the different water cycles, carbon cycles, uh, sun et cetera, et cetera, that all result in conditions that can foster certain kinds of forests. And so even if that forest, say, blows over or something, that forest will come back to be pretty much the same or similar forest on, a, on an ecosystem that's intact. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you go in and clear cut that thing, which is our common practice in British Columbia, it's our, predominantly our method of harvesting, what you do is you you move that whole structure back in time. You you get rid of all of the top stuff, most of the understory, and a lot of the underground part of the ecosystem, which in some cases, in many cases, is actually more complex and contains more biomass and more going on there than it does above ground. That starts to disappear and shrink and simplify. And so you end up with this incredibly simplified piece of land that has lost tons of biodiversity, carbon, nutrients, uh, ability to water cycle, and a whole bunch of other things. 
Mm. So when you grow something back, you're growing it back at a pioneer cereal stage is what we call it, an early cereal stage of growing ecosystem. In early And early cereal stages are part of the landscape, but an early cereal stage after a clear cut is way different than an early cereal stage after a fire or something that nature put in place because nature leaves most of the stuff there. Yeah. In almost all cases, it starts from a very different place. Mm-hmm. So this, I, I don't want to say overlooking of because it, it's just was our thinking was if you can get trees back and growing and it looks like a forest, well, it's good. Yeah. Uh, Yes and no. Yes, at a small scale, you can do that in a plantation type situation. But when you're doing it on a large landscape and there's a whole bunch of other things like wildlife, like uh, genetic diversity, like water, like fish, like uh, people, depending on all of the range of things that that ecosystem provides and you start to oversimplify it, those things start to disappear, become compromised. All the other things that you need start to go away. Yeah. And, uh, and that becomes a problem. That becomes yeah. a problem for municipal water. It becomes a problem for the hunters who love to hunt moose. It becomes a problem for people who love to pick certain kind of plants. It becomes a problem for all the other animals that live there. It becomes a problem for many, many things when you do it at a big enough scale. At, at, on a landscape, it starts to become a problem, not just in a small area. And so, so what we said was we need to change the system. We need to start to focus on maintaining ecosystem health and resilience. And we need to uh, work on the basis that if you take care of the ecosystem, if you take care of the health of the ecosystems, both at a small and a large scale, the connectedness between them and leave patterns on landscapes and look after local ones to build up the big ones, etc., it will take care of almost everything else. Yeah. But we recognize that it was a huge systemic change. Yes. And so we made recommendations. We said, we've got some things that we think you need to actually get these in place to to even start to deal with the change. The first one is, is you've got to do this whole thing with the involving and co-governing under the indigenous community, build the strategy implemented collaboratively with them. We heard that from every place we talked to in British Columbia. We need to prioritize ecosystem health as our number one priority. We need to start looking at a a three zone framework. Um, we called it a, we have existing protected areas and and then most of the landscape outside of those protected areas would be managed from a mimicking ecosystem or consistent with ecosystem kind of way. And then yeah. some small areas would be managed intensively, like plantation. They'd be converted right. and, and managed like agriculture. But those are relatively few in the scheme of things. Right. Um, we would... We would um, strengthen our governance and start to move decision making away from the kind of flip-flop Baltics that uh, many of us have in Canada, many provinces, British Columbia in particular, the ideology changes between administrations. And so it's kind of, when you think about it, it's a bit ludicrous to manage thousands of year ecosystems on a four-year political cycle. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we said we need to ground our governance much better in particularly First Nations under this co-governance and then into regional planning, informed and structured participation and planning and decision making at a regional level with full scientific support. So we move it more out of the political realm and more under this co-governance and locally or regionally grounded planning. We think that would stabilize the whole governance of the system. Uh, We also said we've got a lot of ecosystems that are at risk right now, and we need to defer those. They're at risk of irreversible loss, and we need to defer harvesting in those until we get an ecosystem-based plan in place. We also, in some places, are not in compliance with our own regulations around how much old growth is supposed to be left. We need to get into compliance right now. 
And then, uh, and then we need to make some changes in the management system. We don't define old growth well. We need to change. We need to build a better definition of serial stage and old, old serial stages, and build it into our inventory. Our inventory is built for timber, right? Yeah. And uh, and but and I'm not criticizing our ind- inventory, but when you're starting to manage for ecosystems and serial stage and connectivity and that stuff, you need a different kind of an inventory. It's more like yep. a it's more like a wildlife habitat type matrix as opposed to a in individual attributes that individual attributes is still important for timber but for ecosystem management you need more than that yeah um and so we need to update our inventory to do that we need to change our subculture practices from clear cut to more natural disturbance type appropriate that maintain structure form uh of the of the ecosystems as much as possible and maintain uh, a mosaic on the landscape and connectivity. That's, that means pretty much moving away from clear cut, except for in small circumstances, as opposed to it being like 98% of what we do right now. Yeah. Uh, we need to obviously need to set up this monitoring evaluation and learning as you go piece as part of it. Um, and we need a system that can help us update our, what do we want for outcomes? What's our targets? And update those targets. Because our old targets were very much politically set for old growth in particular. And all of them were set way too low by mm-hmm. any ecological standard. They put us into an extremely high risk of losing biodiversity and many ecosystem services. And so we need to update those um, and then finally, we need to to get to that thing in the future. And there's a few other things in there, but we need to move through an orderly transition with a large provincial plan on how to make the transition and then local community transition plans where the impacts are big. Because getting through the change, everybody believes in the change, but getting from here to there, hard. Oh, yeah. Hard. And so say, that, in yeah. essence, what the old growth review is about is it's not about old growth. It's about changing the way we view and look after land in this yeah. province, period. Yeah. Yeah. Is that all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing to it. But yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, 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 when you, when you paint a picture in that way, it makes it sound so much more um, robust and balanced and interdependent, right? And it just, I think, I think it's easy for everybody to conceptually get to that place of like, yeah, that sounds like an excellent place to be, right? Um, and then, and then the question is, the question that we're here to answer today is, how is that going? <laughs> so, <laughs> how is I think that I want to start with, I, I, I want to start with a, how is that going? With okay, so you were originally, uh, you were originally hired on as an independent contractor with Al Gorley to do the review. And you came up with, you did all this work, you you created all this incredible information, these recommendations, and all of a sudden we're starting to see some real movement in policies and regulation and some deferrals and are starting to see some traction, it seems like, at least from my perspective, on some of these recommendations. So I want to ask you, first of all, uh, now that 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 review process is over, what role have you taken on in this process of making this a reality? And uh, actually, yeah, let's just start with that. What role are you in now and, and how are you involved? Well, I've, I've had two roles since. One was um, they deci- the government decided, okay, we, we got to get on to the deferrals. So we have to identify them. And they asked me to be part of a panel. It's called a technical advisory panel. And they included uh, three scientific experts, uh, myself, and uh, the lady who runs the um, organizing for change. She's kind of the umbrella. It's the umbrella group for all of the environmental type organizations. Okay. Um, And the, the five of us did an analysis to identify what, deferral areas were at threat of irreversible loss and should be deferred from harvesting until we can finish a proper ecosystem, regional, regional ecosystem plants. Um, So we did that analysis. And during that analysis, I mean, we talked all the time. I talked to the 
government folks. Cause you know, after we finished this, Al and I kind of went on and started doing our other things that we have in life and Al's trying yeah. to retire. And <laughs> I had a lot of other big projects on the go, some of which I had to actually give up to do this or work myself out of. So I went and started doing some other things and he did. And, uh, and then they, they asked me if I would do this. And so I said, yeah. And then they kept asking me questions about this and how to do this. And I'd explain it. And next thing they realized, holy crap, this is valuable. Like yep. somebody who can see the picture. And so I guess uh, they asked me if I would come back again as an independent um, mentor, uh, a coach, um, and a facilitator, an advisor to help basically us as a province to move through this process. So. You know, just trying to get our thinking elevated a bit. And I don't have all the answers, but I right. do know a lot about how to get our thinking aligned and how to bring people together. I, I'm not saying I'm magic or something like that, because, I mean, <laughs> this thing could still go south. It's, oh, we, for sure. We, yeah, it's, this, is a, this is a big change. This is a societal change. and mm -hmm. So that's my role now. Um, and it's a so, lot to place on one man's shoulders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've got a, I've got a friend who we're trying to, um, we're trying to coerce or entice or whatever into coming and kind of being <laughs> with me a little bit. And I'm hoping we can convince her. We, I think we have convinced her to do at least a couple little pieces. And I don't want to say little because every one of these things is big. Yeah. Every shift is big. It's, yeah. You got to think about it. We are shifting from three major, major shifts right now. The first one being our current relationship with the indigenous or with the First Nations in particular who hold the rights is very much a consultation and accommodation type relationship. We right. consult you and try to accommodate your concerns with respect to impacts on your Aboriginal rights and your kind of way of life. But as we move to an UNDRIP, a United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People world, well, now we're moving from purely consultation accommodation to uh, joint governance, basically, um, of land yeah. and many yeah. other things, education, health, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, it's a transformative change. Well, well we are trying to figure out how do you do that, plus trying to figure out how do we move how do we create and empower and educate and start building these kind of inclusive, multi-sectoral, regional-based planning, decision-making entities under that umbrella? And how do we shift our entire mental framework and processes and all of that stuff from focusing on individual resources to focusing on ecosystems? Those are every one of those is huge, and we're doing oh all three God. at once. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. insane. It's it's a, yeah. it's a big bite to chew off all at one time, right? You're like, yeah. okay, we're yeah. just going to change the whole governing system, uh, and the governing system is hard enough to change because, yeah, like uh, yeah. <laughs> colonialism picked up the ball of of we're in charge, and they're going to have a hard time letting go. <laughs> yeah, and then then you're going to change everybody's mindset, the human mindset, from a short term thinking. Uh, to a long-term thinking of like, how do we keep the ecosystem sustainable for as long as humanly possible and beyond? And then, yeah. <laughs> so you're trying to change everything. And it's, 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 but I think it's, it's so refreshing to hear that this is a, this is a real plan and real recommendations and they're being taken seriously and being talked about seriously. And the changes are happening in a real way. Cause it's, I think, a lot of people see a lot of frustrations with not just with forestry, but with, uh, you know, with commercialism in general and, and capitalism and, and the way colonialism has, has organized this world. Right. And I think this is an incredible way to show, Hey, look what we can do when we start to cooperate and we, we change our thinking from a purely colonial one to one of co-governance and one of ecosystem mindset. Right. Like it's, it's, it's just fascinating. It is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, for me, my, that's, this has been my life pretty much for a very long time. So it's kind of just another version of the same theme, but, 
But uh, this is the biggest scale for me personally that I've tried to facilitate this change. I've been involved in writing some, you know, big standards and declarations and stuff like that, like international, but those things don't change the world. They, Mm. they're words on paper, right? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't, uh, like UNDRIP, I think actually has helped us change the world. FSC and a few of those others. I'm not so sure about Mm. those. Um, because if you don't change that core thinking, and you don't enlighten people, then the rest of it is, you know, lipstick on a pig, frankly. You're just <laughs> making it look a little nicer, but it hasn't really changed. Yeah, Underneath, yeah. This, the yeah. same issues are there. And, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's puck handling, right? Like you're just kind of stick handling the situation. You're like, okay, well, if you move a little bit this way or move a little bit this way, but you're, you're proposing, uh, okay, let's, let's reset, let's reset this. And let's see how we can do this better. No one says we have to do it the way we're doing it just because that's the way we've been doing it. We have the ability and capacity to change this and make it what we want to be and what's best for everybody and every value, right? We don't have to keep doing it this way just because it's easy. No, and and it's more it's more sustainable, if that would be the word I'd use. Uh, I I would prefer to think of it more like longer term and stable. Sure. It's going to change our relationship with land. There's no question, our economic relationship and quite a few other relationships. We will end up with a different kind of an economy. I I think it's still going to have a big wood component, process wood component. But we really wanted to also, along with the shift, shift to much more local uh, use and manufacture and higher value type uh, model. And we are working actively to do that parallel with this. It was, there was a number of things that we wanted to recommend also, but they were just a bit too far outside of the scope, but we did talk to the ministers and I've been talking steadily to government that parallel to this, we need to be doing this and this and this and this to make this whole thing work. And some of them are sticking and, and, and we're, we're working on them actively. One of them is this, what does our new economic relationship look like with, with land? And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, similar to you in Alberta, uh, with your oil and gas, we have a very deeply rooted bias towards timber in British mm-hmm. Columbia. Mm-hmm. Uh, the province was built pretty much off the backs of, and it's been romanticized and glorified. And it's kind of a core part of our culture for many, many years. Um, right. And and I'm not saying that in a critical kind of way. It just is where we came from and who we are. Yep. Well, that, that, That bias or that cultural root is very, very deep in our society, but it is shifting. I'll I'll tell you a little example, which I found really amusing, was um, there was a time when, uh, not very long ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe even as little as 15 years ago, uh, maybe even 10 possible, but um, where, you know, you see a picture of a logging truck with one tree on it. And yeah. the logging truck's full, eh? And you're just going like, wow, friggin' <laughs> amazing. Everybody's yeah. like, whoa. Well, there was a picture in the newspaper uh, about five years ago, seven years ago, something like that. And it had three trees on it. And the reaction was, that's disgusting. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't be cutting those. And, like, it was just a completely different reaction than you would have had as little as a decade before that or maybe even less isn't that wild like Like, the the whole idea of like oh like oh look at that huge tree that we were able to conquer like yay yay us like the conquering humans (laughs) to now being like that's that's so upsetting that we're still haven't learned that yeah there's more to it than that yeah it's wow (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it was. I thought it was a really graphic, and I had to chuckle when I saw it. And I just thought, yeah. ah, society. Well, Al and I heard it too from every sector uh, that uh, societal views and values have significantly shifted, yeah. and we just haven't caught up. 
in in yeah. our management and oh yeah and it'll con- continue to shift it's not like this is the this is the peak of of <laughs> oh, what no. the societal views oh. will be right they're only going to get more progressive over time and that's just the nature of of society right and so it's it's yeah. it's going to continue so they got to keep up at least and and try to create something that is like you said stable if you don't want to use yeah. the word sustainable right that's what so, i use is stable because if you start to build resilient landscapes that pro- that have healthy ecosystems those ecosystems yield benefits or water and trees and stuff and if, as long as you're taking it within the boundaries of maintaining the balance and the health of the all of that that stuff will last indefinitely i mean right. you know failing climate change or something catastrophic at a major scale but those landscapes also tend to be quite resilient in that they can adjust to changes in right. fire patterns and bugs and stuff. And they, they're used to those things. Now, again, climate change may cause a, a shift and there may be a period there, but you got a much better chance of riding that kind of thing out with a yeah. resilient, healthy landscape that's well diversified and connected yeah. across and, and it, like a big organism than you do with a landscape that's all one species or fractured or not functioning well or stuff. You Impacts are a lot bigger when things happen. Oh yeah. And we can't yeah. be, we can't be riding the edge of the, of the, of the yield curve when it comes to, to harvesting, when we know that climate change is on route and more and more yeah. fires. And yeah, we gotta, we gotta be hedging our bets and, and knowing that shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> we got to yeah. be careful without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask you about the importance for you uh, in your new role as this facilitator, private contractor person who's trying to, uh, who's, who's trying to maintain this vision and trying to provide support where you can uh, the importance, the importance of, of, of staying objective and remaining objective ah. and, and being able to, being able to, to, to be that facilitator that everybody trusts right and yep. knows that there's thinking about this in a balanced way how have you gone about how have you gone about managing that ability because i mean everyone has their biases everybody has their leanings but to try and remain somebody with a clear vision that can remain objective that everyone can come to and respect um that has to be incredibly challenging yeah yeah um, kind of you know part of it Part of it is the way that I personally see the world, um, and it's a lot of my own upbringing um, in uh, in 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 my Teltan and Indigenous world, and part of it is just because I've always been interested in watching behavior of organisms and beings of all kinds, so particularly humans and how humans evolve and and adapt and grow. Um, So for me, when I'm watching this happen, um, many years uh, ago, I wrote this piece called uh, What is Sustainability? And uh, I'll just give you the short version of it. Sustainability is not like, uh, it's it's not an end. It's not a place you go to it's not the golden cow it's 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 a discipline it's a it's a way of being where you just get better and better and better at living in your place and kind of surrendering to the fact that you're infinitely small in a place you know nothing about and nothing about that will ever change and just completely living in that space building your discipline around that well if you accept that, then you say, okay, what what about those who don't, aren't like that? Well, you know what? I can't just, I just can't go poof and all of a sudden you're enlightened. Right. Like you have to, you have to go through your own journey to grow there. And so my role is not to beat anything into you. My role is to help you come to your own enlightenment and then help you understand how to translate that enlightenment in the reality. And, and so I have two parts of it. And I, I find it's not too hard to change people's way of thinking. But if they don't have something to fill in the gaps 
and they don't have the kind of time that it takes to figure out how do I actually make something to make it work, they will yeah. default back to their old behavior. Like, I, you know, it's, a, I, I guess, a, a drinker or smoker or something like that. If they go right back into the old environment with no new supports and no way of doing, they often will just fall back into the old pattern of behavior, right? Right. Um, like addictions are like that. And any other thing that we do as human beings is a lot like that. That's our nature. Yeah. The, the second thing is, is let's just say, let's just say that we fail completely as a human species and and we just don't get there and we basically take the way of the dinosaurs probably self-caused sure. let's just say that happened well how do you deal with that i don't know did you ever watch that old walt disney show many years ago where it showed all these lemmings running off the cliff oh yes yes yeah. i know what you're talking about yeah fascinating right all yeah, these yeah. lemmings they get too many of them and they just start running off the cliff and then the next right. thing the population gets down and the birds kind of get down and everybody can live in balance again for a while till it happens and then it happens again and you're just going wow that's freaking fascinating well what if it's us until yeah. you can see it the same way you are you are still in the forest or you're still yeah. in the trees. You're not at the forest. And so yeah. it takes a discipline also to step above and look across humans and across animals and across things and say, okay, I see the pattern and I see what's going on and I'm not here to judge it. I'm just here to, how can I maybe help move this to the next phase of being? That's yeah. my role. And so that's how I do it is, and I don't have, um, I always, I'm very clear to people. Like I've had a lot of people ask me to come work for them and help them with this. And I said, well, I can come and help you as part of my role, but I'm not going to come and work for you because it's really critical that I remain the person that everybody can, wants to talk to. Cause nobody has to work with me. Right. They all ask me to do it and, uh, and government pays the bill. And, uh, and so and they understand. In fact, they say, you know what? We agree. We support that because we want you yeah. to be that. We yeah. want you to be that person because we need people like that. We, For this kind of transition, we need those kind of people. Oh, and, yeah. You know, I, I, I wish there was more of me right now, but uh, right now there isn't. I think they're out there. And I'm like I said, I'm trying to groom one right now. And I'm, I've got, actually got another one that I think I've groomed. Well, I, I don't want to say I've groomed. He yeah. has groomed himself in his life, and I've kind of been, he's younger. I've been help guide him a lot. He's He runs the First Nations Forestry Council right now, and he is a real bringing people together and helping them understand and enlighten and grow, and he's just getting better and better at that. And uh, And so we're getting more and more people in key positions that are yeah. like this. And we talk and our conversations are fascinating because we don't just yeah. talk about trees. We talk about societal evolution. Uh, yeah. Okay. And how do we facilitate that? We talk about, we've got this whole group who's stuck in the mud over here. How do we help them enlighten and grow and, you know, be, be good about what they're doing and really get working on this and et cetera. It's, it's a lot of that kind of conversation as much as it is about the kind of technical nuts and bolts of how to do it. Yeah, for so sure. I find yeah, that start, fascinating. Oh, wildly yeah. so. You got to start calling yourself Gary the Guru. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I usually just characterize it more as Lord takes care of drunkards and fools. And it just seems, <laughs> seems to work for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a fascinatingly difficult situation to be in. But but these types of causes, I think it's it's huge that they need people like yourself and people that are the person who has the focus, right? Because like you can create the old growth review and you can create the the potential for policy changes and stuff. But unless there's somebody driving that force, it's going to fall flat, right? And so you need those people that can that can make that. And, and force that to happen because, like you said, that old growth review happened 30 years ago, and it ended up falling flat probably for a lot of the same reasons, right? There was there was maybe no driving force, and so I think um, I would like to, I would like to jump into 
what kind of progress you're seeing now? Like what, what is, what is on the table now? What has happened? I know there's been a lot of old growth deferrals that were supposed to take place for only two years, but now it's, it's obviously been more than that. This was 2020. And so, um, there, there, those deferrals are continued, but I want to talk about, yeah, what, what has happened? What's, what's the progress so far? We have, we are working actively on many things and some things have shown a lot of progress and some, some are still in the wings because this is big and, uh, and it's taken us a while. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, not to make excuses, but to talk about reality, you can't underestimate the effect that COVID had on implementation of this. Um, and that, but that whole thing took us a good, I'd say six months, but I'd actually think it was more like a year to even get half as proficient to where we could do right. major involved in depth things like this. Yeah. And the second part was, is at exactly pretty much the same time, the government implemented DRIPA. And so what the government said, in order to be consistent with the principles of DRIPA, we need to make sure that we're doing this thing as much as possible in partnership with the Indigenous community. Well, the Indigenous community is not organized to do this. There's 200 and some First Nations in British Columbia, and and uh, some you can kind of talk to in collective, but very few. Most mm. of it, you have to go out and actually talk to them, and and they change a lot. Like their staff change, their leadership changes, and things are changing a lot. And so you're trying to talk to Jello that's moving all over the place all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I'm it's good. just crazy. And that's not a criticism. That's just where we're at. You, yeah. you pick any 200 communities and try to do that without structure over top of it. That's why this land governance thing is so critical is because we've got to build some structure around this whole thing, a governance structure and framework. Um, but anyway, so, so that added a whole bunch. And, you know, the first decision government made was we're doing the deferrals. Well, how? Who do yeah. you talk to? How do you, like, just how? <laughs> yeah, when yeah, you, yeah, when yeah. You, They said, and so what they said was, we're going to do an, a technical analysis. We're going to get our best guess based on our imperfect information that we have. And we're going to put it out and say, we won't implement it until local First Nations agree. That's what government said. Right. Well, you know, there was mixed reactions to that from Yahoo, good, about time, and yeah, we support it, to uh, you guys are trying to pull something over on us. No, we don't want it. And and all the way in between. In spite of all that, there is very strong intent and a lot of progress, but not, I don't think, what we would have envisioned sitting in our bit of a dream world of Al and I before all this, right? <laughs> right. You know, in a perfect world, you should be able to do this and this and this. Well, planning, life is what happens while you're planning what you're going to do. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's that other saying that God laughs at those who makes plans. Well, yeah. definitely laughing right now. Oh, yeah. We had this kind of, okay, if it was perfect world, we'd be, we would have been deep into everything right now. And we're not. Right. Some some things we're pretty light into. Some things we haven't quite started yet because we don't have the structures in place. We don't have the process. We don't have the paradigm shift fully realized. So where are we at? We're uh, the three zone management framework. We've got a few ideas kicking around out there. Uh, the industry has done a bit of work on this, but I would I would characterize it as very young thinking because we really haven't got our minds totally around what does it mean to manage for ecosystems and ecosystem health yet. Oh, yeah. We still are, we still have an entire legislative and operational framework that's based on timber, timber yeah. in our forest and, and other resources. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, this inclusive and stabilizing approach to governance, we have, um, we are doing it with the eye to how do we start to pull these together? Okay. We, we are currently implementing a new level of plan in British Columbia in the forest sector called the Forest Landscape Plan. And what that does, um, our previous management framework was based on forest stewardship plans. The problem with that whole planning thing is everybody was out there doing them and, and compliant, but a lot of the landscape stuff was being missed 
because there was no uh, knitting going on. Like I government see. kind of vacated its knitting and pulling together and keeping that landscape focus. And Everyone's so a lot of things thing. like old growth and stuff got compromised. Right. And so, so this forest landscape planning, what it does now is it involves multi-sectoral groups um, to build forest plans that show how do higher level plans lay out on a landscape and how do we maintain ecosystem health on a landscape and those guide operational forest plans from uh, that I point. See, okay. And so we're learning how to do those. We've got, and we're going to keep pushing those and those are really hands-on. They're built G to G, meaning we build them, we build the terms of reference and the framework with the indigenous governments in the area. Then we structure all of the tables and planning underneath that. And then we learn, okay, what does ecosystem health management mean for us and bringing in scientists and whatever and, and building a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. On the public information side, what does a public information function look like and how does it tie to our whole monitoring evaluation update reporting function we want that whole thing to be a bit seamless so and including access right down to the technical data we want people technical people to be able to get access to the more nuts and bolts parts of the information and do yep. their own scrutinizing and their right. own analysis and have a mechanism for the raise, well, you didn't look at this right or you didn't yeah. whatever. Like that's the nature of this beast. You have to yes. learn and do it together. So the rudiments of that are starting to come into place. Uh, the deferrals, um, we've got, I don't know, 90% or something of the deferred areas are in place now. And right. agreed that's to, huge though. Uh, it's huge. It's a big number. Um that but, in alone and of itself tells a big story about the support behind this program, right? That the fact that you've been able to defer yeah. that much of it is, is tells you that this is real serious. Like we might actually be able to accomplish something, something real and tangible here. Yeah. I mean, there's always a but in there and there are some, because <laughs> there are some First Nations who haven't agreed yet and the province. Sure. Um, Harvesting is happening in deferral areas where they haven't agreed. And the province itself is doing that in some of its BC timber sales areas. Uh, um, so I don't want to say it's just a simple yes. It's There's a lot yeah. of stuff around the edges of that, that that aren't as pure as you might just a pure straight up stop it kind of thing. There's a lot of fuzziness in little areas, but overall, from my perspective, we are doing, we are doing this with serious intent. Your, your observation yeah. is right. There are some pieces though, that are getting scrutinized and getting a lot of press. And frankly, I think they should. It's good that people are looking at it and going, well, you didn't, do what you said you were going to do, or you're not living by the intent in here and, and making us think about it. Well, that's good. The system yeah. needs to be kept sharp. I, I yeah. don't have any problem with that. Um, yeah. We are, um, we are in out of compliance with our existing old growth orders in some areas where we specified that so much percentage of the old growth needs to be retained and old growth attributes. And so we, um, we are getting those areas back into compliance with okay. ecosystem restoration plans. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Our inventory, uh, we are doing LIDAR now for the province, which is going to help us hugely. But yeah. in terms of the classification, we have some some of our scientists and a few others looking at how can we build in this these new classifications and ecosystem planning a reality just like we do with timber like we need to yeah. describe them better um yeah. that work you can't manage what's out there unless you know what's out there right yeah and i would characterize that work as in the young thinking stages and then we um in terms of alternative civiculture systems um where this is at more right now is we're looking at updating our whole civil culture handbook and we've got a uh, some money allocated to a research uh one of the research institutions who are looking at how do we implement this across the province 
and what are the systems and trying to build a whole new guidance framework on that. This is one that for me, I feel like, uh, I think we could be making a lot better progress on it, but I don't know. I think I've, I've, I've a bit failed on this one to convince the whole system how important practices are. We've convinced them how important deferring certain areas are because they're irreplaceable. Right. Well, practices are equally important from the point of view that you could maintain structural attributes of, of particularly old forests that could allow, give you more to work with when you plan, but also um, in terms of public satisfaction with what you're doing or natural disturbance type appropriate civil culture systems tend to be much friendlier and much more preserve many other forest values that people don't get as upset about those. And yeah. so it just makes so much sense to do these as soon as we can. And finally, at the provincial level, um, there's this orderly transition. Um, and we, um, we are building an old growth action plan right now. In spite of the fact that we're doing everything, we're still building yeah. this provincial plan actively writing it for approval, ideally in September, um, along with the oh. framework on the declaration biodiversity or ecosystem health. We do have a couple small uh, programs put in place for transition support right now for communities. That is the last recommendation, but I think we'll see those ramp up a bit more once we start to see the ecosystem plan starting to formalize, because that's where yeah. we're going to really start to understand what is the potential transition needs. For sure. That, when you start I know to that's look at maybe the... a bit more detailed than you wanted, but that's kind of where <laughs> we're at. Yeah. No, no, no. More context is better, right? It's 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 always good to get the full picture because I don't think there's anybody else in the province that can 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 provide the details the way you can, right? So, um, or even in the country, I should say. So, like, there's a lot. Yeah, there's like I, I think in the three years since the old growth review came out, there's obviously a lot of balls in the air. COVID came in, slowed things down, but. I would say that the fact that you've managed to maintain a focus provincially on this issue over three years in and of itself is a huge, huge accomplishment, right? The fact yeah. that there is movement and, you know, considering all of these factors that slowed it down, it's, it's, it's incredible. And like you've got all these things to focus on all at once and you're trying to move them all forward at the same time. Nobody can, nobody could, can point to you and be like, Hey, why isn't this open? What have you accomplished? What is, why isn't this done yet? Like, I think you should be pretty proud with what you've been able to move forward. Just in the simple fact that you've managed to get so many people on board, right? And that you're starting to see real, real changes in, in, in mindset and that kind of thing clearly. So, I think I want to ask you. I want to ask you as far as in your role and and, and watching all these things come come about. Um, you're still you're still kind of changing hearts and minds and trying to get people on board and making sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, are you? Do you feel satisfied that the rate of change is is going to continue and that people are coming along for this ride and you think this is going to be something that's going to be. Uh, you know, say, say once you let go of the reins that someone else takes over and that this will continue and that you'll, we'll see these changes, you know, in the next decade or so that, that this paradigm shift can take shape and we can really start to feel the difference. And, you know, I feel like BC can start to become really a, a fascinating place to point to and be like, look what BC is up to. That's pretty incredible that they've managed to do this co-governance thing and this, this three system, three management system, like three tiered management system thing. And all of this stuff that you, that, that is in the plan. Um, yeah. How do you feel about the progress and the rate of change and the, and the way that the hearts and minds are coming along with it? Um, there was a whole bunch of questions buried in that question. So I want to, um, I want to read you something first, just to start the answer. Yep. That three-zone management framework is what we are working on on the timber side right now, and we'll probably yeah. do that. But I want to read to you, we're building, um, we're building a conservation financing mechanism in this province right now, and we can expect to see some significant announcements around that soon. Yeah. But one of, the, one of the 
I have written an outcome that resonates with the entire conservation community and many of government now that I am hoping and I've been trying to advocate that we work towards. And, and many people are starting to get this idea. So let's just talk about how to how do we get beyond this need for protection and not protection and all that stuff for a minute. Like sure. in, in my language and, and in any other indigenous language, we really don't have a word for protection because the concept just doesn't exist. The land okay. is meant to be used. It's how you use it that matters. Right. So yes, there are certain areas because they're highly spiritual that only certain people can go in there and do certain things, or there's certain areas that are really important for other animals and key parts of their lives. And so you just don't go in there when they're doing their thing or stuff like that. There's, there's yeah. behaviors that you do to fit with the land, sure. but that's not protection. You can still right. use it, but it's how it's respect. So, <laughs> well, with knowing your place, yes, respect, I guess yeah. you can call it, but really it's, I would characterize it more like humility. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's just say that we kind of get to that place. So I'll read this out to you. We've achieved a level of land stewardship that conserves ecosystem and bi health and biodiversity consistent with the way that it has been, the natural range of variation uh, that has resulted in an adaptable, a resilient, and a resistant landscape across the province. This approach is broadly understood, supported by, and meaningfully involves the broader public. We look after the land as a whole, and we've risen above the need to permanently protect certain areas because the entire provincial landscape is under this stewardship framework. And this is all done under a provincial indigenous co-governance umbrella. Right. That's, that's a bit of an outcome. That's uh, huge. Yeah, that's yeah. huge. That's a, right? that's a big, big shift in the way we think about forests and our, our role in, yeah, our relationship with them, right? Right, right. And so you're saying... Well, can we expect to see this changes and do you think it'll last and kind of a set of questions around that? I would say that in the short term, we probably shouldn't expect too many more big initiatives to come into play, but there okay. is going to be some big announcements in the next few months. Because government's getting ready for an election. Right. And yep. so it's really important to this government to show meaningful, substantive progress on this whole land thing and old growth thing. Yep. You know, what, what I just talked to you about is while I'm talking about old growth, this is not about old growth. It's about how we manage land in general. And the old growth review is encapsulates a lot of that. But there's a lot of other stuff going on, too. So we can ex expect some very substantive announcements in the next few months around this because we have so many initiatives underway right mm -hmm. now that are all leading towards that because we're coming up to a provincial election. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, and so government <laughs> doesn't usually announce major new things that it's going to do within six months or even a year before its next election. And it's made some, it's, it's made announcements. We're doing things. We got the forest landscape plan. All those are underway. We've got all these other pieces that I've alluded to underway and they're all coming to fruition in the fall or before the new year. And we'll see a series of rolled out well-timed and well-orchestrated announcements. Yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. yeah. That's the way yeah, government, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, and it doesn't yeah. matter who's in there. That's the way government works. Yeah. And so, but I, I don't We need a Gary this. Merkel for politics. We need yeah. a Gary Merkel for politics to mix things up. They've <laughs> changed the paradigm shift in politics. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, um, so I don't expect to see any major new initiatives coming into play in that period. Although I do think we're going to see some big chunks come in that were a bit of a surprise. The government may say, you know what, I know we didn't say that, but we're willing to approve that. The The alternative civil culture piece might yield some really interesting things before then. Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, after the election, hard to say. Uh, you know, I guess it depends on which party comes in and what their yeah. ideology is. Everything to me indicates that this party is going to carry on doing what they're doing. Um, but, you know, politics is fickle. So That's I never... About, yeah. Yeah, you, you just never so, know. Uh, no, you never know do. what's going on. So, what about the people at the table, like the people that are, that you're speaking with from all the different stakeholders, right? From First Nations to to industry to NGOs and to you know all the all the people that are at the table. Um, are you seeing any kind of consensus? Are you seeing people slowly start to – you talked at the beginning about this mind shift, right? About shifting the way we think about land and our relationship to land and changing – just like having that gear change, right? Um, are you seeing the beginnings of that gear change and more of a consensus across the board from all the stakeholders? Or is there um, – I mean, I'm sure no one's ever at the same – at the exact same place. But are you seeing a progress that that makes you – you know, um, hopeful that this will continue. What I am seeing is a lot of people, including the forest industry, the mining sector, the oil and gas sector, um, who are realizing that this is the way we have to go. It just makes absolute sense. The whole writings on the, the wall. wildlife. Yeah. yeah. You, this is the way we have to go getting there hard. Yeah. But yeah, and but they get the idea. It's just the getting there part, and how do we, and again, how do we look after each other? But as I said to you before, if if it gets too hard and we can't figure it out, and we waffle around forever. Yeah. We end up kind of reverting back and bringing in the old stuff with just a yeah. little window dressing on it. That's what happens, and so so yeah. there is a real critical need to maintain some momentum here. Momentum um, and, a, and a clear roadmap, right? Yeah, a clear, clear roadmap. roadmap. What Absolutely. are the steps? And like, okay, we finished this, now what? And like, yeah, you need that laid out for everyone to follow. Um, one of the pieces that I failed to mention that we are actively building right now, and I'm working on this with Walrus and Ministry of Forests, because they're the two lead agencies, is um, is a vision of what does our whole land stewardship framework look like when we get through this? Yeah. And so we've got a lot of that laid out now and, uh, and, and it's looking pretty good. And, uh, and, uh, what we're hoping to do is get that endorsed in principle by cabinet to say, you know, we know that it, this, the endorsement means that we know that this probably is going to change hugely as we go out and we, uh, work with others to adjust. And that there's going to be, and it's going to evolve and everything, but we're not afraid of this vision. It kind of mostly is, describes where we're trying to get to. Uh, that, yeah. yeah. And government's not, a lot of times, not comfortable with that level of uncertainty and throwing out essentially straw dogs. And, and, yeah. but, but <laughs> we have to get comfortable with that. And, Every, my conversation so far with uh, the political leaders is we're, we're willing to look at that. Yes. Yeah. And it's a bit uncomfortable for us, but at the same time, uh, we're willing to do it because they did it with DRIPA. DRIPA, DRIPA, all DRIPA said was, we believe in UNDRIP and we're going to change our legislative framework and our policy framework to conform to UNDRIP in partnership with First Nations. That's what it said. And people say, yeah. well, what's that mean? And they say, well, we don't know. <laughs> we just know we're going to do it. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're yeah. holding hands. We're taking a big leap of faith, faith and we're jumping off the cliff together. Yeah. And, and you that's know what, what it takes, right? Someone has that's, to make the example of it. And then and the public went, good, about time. Let's figure yeah. it out. Yeah. We know we got to get there. We could have, yeah. we danced around this forever. And so, yeah. So, um, the waffling gets infuriating, right? You're just like, yeah. I, we know, everyone knows, like everyone already knows. Yeah, we need to do that. Like what the hell is holding us up? Yeah. yeah. So will this survive for the long term, you know, after people like me are gone? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I um, My personality requires me to be inherently optimistic, a glass half full sure. kind of person. Because yeah. if I wasn't, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. I just wouldn't be able to put the kind of passion and focus <laughs> yeah. into it. I'd just be 
always negative and whatever. What's the uh, point? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, I know some people. We all have our way of seeing the world. That's the way I see the world. So I have to believe that I that I can be part of making a change. And everybody else who's doing this at this scale believes that too. That we can all be part of making this. But this kind of thing just doesn't happen with one person. I mean, this is no. This is a movement. Yes. This is, and it's got a lot of moving parts and it requires all kinds of leaders kind of harmonizing together and linking to make it happen. And so it's, it's enormous. Uh, it's enormous. It's a wild and, undertaking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I've been part of these kinds of things in my life before, major, major changes. And when you look back at them, you go, holy shit, that was remarkable how everything kind of lined <laughs> up, how the planets yeah. just chink, 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 and poof, and yeah. the next thing. So I have to believe that it'll be like that. I mean, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the one that gives me the most hope, the the component that gives me the most hope. And that is the uh, indigenous community. And I'll tell you why. It's because I have been working a lot with others and many others are working on supporting that community to understand and start developing its own land stewardship approaches based on its understanding of its connection to nature. Right. So, so though, and almost all of those approaches, the first thing they do is go back to what's our beliefs. Who are we as a people? And they, every time that they do that, I have not seen an example of otherwise yet. They go back to their historic, we are part of nature, one small part, and we got to act like that kind of approach. And when they do that, they create very different and unique and incredibly brilliant and practical land management approaches, land stewardship approaches. And the more of them that do that, the less able we are to resist going down uh, that path with them because they're part of co-governing. And, yeah. and you say, well, you can't do that. And they go, no, bullshit. Look at I'm doing it right here. My buddy's <laughs> doing it over here. My other one's doing it over here. You can do it. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. that's what I think is really going to help us a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the, there's, there's people out there that know, you know what's right. You know mm-hmm. what's, what's going to work and you know what's right. And don't worry about so much about you know, the specifics about it. If you can do it, just do the thing. Cause it's, it takes the people of action to, to make these changes, to give other people the courage to stand up and do the same thing. Right. And yeah, I think you're right. I think it just, just, just let's just do it. Let's just do it. What are we waiting for? When you're building a movement, it's a, uh, it's a delicate balance. I tell you, yeah. you, you oh, just, I bet. <laughs> it's always, yeah, you're always, you're always moving fast enough that people and keeping people connected enough and seeing enough that they feel a sense of momentum, but yeah. not too fast where you start to marginalize and isolate and anger too many at the same time. Like it's, we, we mm-hmm. characterize it that we're moving at the speed of understanding and trust. That doesn't sound like a very fast speed. <laughs> yeah but it's it's if you want it to last that's the speed yeah. you that's the speed you got to work at and so you yeah. can do a lot of things to help speed that up but that yeah. is what you are building it at and so so yeah. your focus is not any more about how many more widgets can i jam out the back end my focus yeah. is on how to how do we get ourselves aligned and then start building something that we all believe in and will support and and yeah. you know if it takes me a little while longer yeah. When you're building a legacy, you can take a little longer viewpoint because instead of yeah. building three things that you throw on the shelf or throw away, you build one thing that everybody dies on and, and lives by and supports from that point on. And you build a mechanism for them to learn from it and grow and update it. And they just build more and more ownership and connection to it. You try to dra- grab that out of their hands and throw it away. It just oh. doesn't happen. It's it pretty yeah. damn hard. I mean, it could, <laughs> I guess, but it's hard. Yeah. So that's well, the that's, that's a, the thinking. Build something to yeah. last. That's a beautiful sentiment, and it, I think it paints an excellent picture in people's minds of what 
this change is going to require, right? What's go- what's it going to take to make sure that these things work out? Yeah, I I love it. I, I and speaking to that, to those people that are that are listening in that don't have a direct connection to this and and have no way, but they have strong opinions and they want to they want to support this. Is there is there any way that people can? What's the best thing that people can do to help support this this movement, as you put it? Um. I know there's no direct like I think that's why I ask because it's it's hard for people to see from the outside looking in like how do I show support how do I how do I help out right if there is a way well you know people is such a big word right but I'll, <laughs> yeah. so it just there's so many my mind has this disease where it starts to go down into details very quickly. And I'm trying to think about all, who are all these people and how does each one think and work? But I, so I got to push my mind back up a bit. I I think for me, um, first off, well, there's two things because it all does come down to individuals. Sure. It comes down to individuals. Right. And, uh, and, Individuals are the ones who are going to make this happen. So for you as an individual, start to learn what you don't know and learn about how ecosystems work and how other countries, and you can, you can do Google searches and read a ton of really cool, interesting stuff. And you don't even have to pick on the real deep scientific stuff. You just kind of start to make it part of your life and make it a bit of your personal purpose that I want to know a lot more about this and I read a lot more about it. And uh, there's there's just such a ton of wealth of stuff out there, including on this, uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, um, and one of these days I will create a website and put a lot of my stuff on there too, just to let people beat the crap out of that because I've yeah. written on this stuff for 30, 40 years now. Um, people want that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're building a fascinating new program where we're going to learn a whole bunch more too at UBC. I'll talk about that in a minute, but, um, but then once you've started to really learn, I think, uh, you, you want to let your local political people know that this is something that we should be doing because everybody has a chance to talk to their local government or their local MLA or whatever their local MP is. This is, this is the way we need to do this, or this is a good solid approach. And we believe in this and just really letting them know that because these people, they care. I mean, votes are currency for them, right? And if you're a registered voter telling them this is what you like, and they have a hundred or 200 or 300 of them telling you, you know, this is Alice's restaurant happening in, in real life, uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, you could send the email. They have to, they, they, they go through those emails, right? Oh, like, yeah. Christ. And they pay attention to what people want and especially yeah. people who take the time to tell them. Yeah. And you know what, if you need to, and you really feel like you got to organize some people, well, organize a bunch of people, to tell them together. Um, and if they keep hearing it, and if you start to be watching and maybe a little more scrutinizing and a little more, we, we love this, but this part's not working and tell them why and start to get that stuff built into, it, it, it does start to work. Now, we don't at this point have a um, mechanism built in for the broader public to provide scrutiny and comment. Mm-hmm. Um, that gets but, I'm, but I'm going to think about that a little bit uh, because uh, you know what? I There's parts of that at, that are very attractive. I mean, I know you're going to get people who are going to be negative <laughs> as well, right. but that's, you know, that's life. That's, yep. and there's going to be wing nuts out there. who are just going to be whatever, just do it for the, you know, the sake of being a shit disturber, whatever, but they're easy be, to weed out though. They're yeah, pretty obvious. Yeah, when you, they're when you start usually reading. pretty easy. And then you got a whole bunch of thoughtful uh, kind of informed input that becomes really useful in understanding the pulse and the wisdom out there. And, yep. and, I I don't know if I've said this yet, but I but I want to be clear that 
while this style of management is, it does have a lot of science in it. There's no question, but it is hugely wisdom based. Yeah. It, if you think about it for a few Absolutely. minutes, it's absolutely about how do I live with the land and how do I blend in and fit within nature's patterns. The indigenous communities have learned this, or most of them are earth-based communities who have learned to do this. This is a very practical, common sense, paying attention to what the land's doing, what are the animals doing, what's the water doing, and living within that. And yes, there may be some scientific stuff that can help you inform that, but this is not a numbers stats thing anymore. And yeah. so when I talk to people about, they say, well, how do we talk to people about this? I say, go talk to them about what do they know about the land and what do they see? particularly indigenous communities and the ones who've lived on it for a long time, who still are land people, they'll tell you stuff that you go, holy crap, I never knew that. Like, yeah. And then you, you start to know your land mm -hmm. way better. And so, so that is the process and the kind of whole paradigm shift that I was speaking to a paradigm shift is, is simply a, re, a, a significant change in thought. That's yeah. all it is. It's not action. Action comes because you made a paradigm shift and you have chosen to restructure the way you do things to accommodate that. Now, sometimes a paradigm shift is forced on you like COVID. Right. COVID changed the way we thought about the planet and about disease and about how we structure our communities and economy. And so we translated that into action very, very quickly and started redesigning communities and the way we do meetings and the way we do everything to accommodate that whole new way of thinking about staying not so close to each other anymore and building space for us to be full human beings with space. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the same kind of thing as you as an individual, this paradigm shift is, uh, it takes time. It's, it's not something you can, you, it's, it's, it's a bit like, it sounds a bit dreamy or idealistic or rose, whatever. Like it sounds, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. That doesn't mean you've made the shift. That just no. means you got, you got a good idea about it. Now I got to learn a whole bunch of stuff so I can move my mind over there. And then I can yeah. start to think about, oh, and what can I do? It's like changing your cultural perspective, right? It is. It's like, try, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, the, it's the hardest thing you'll ever try to do is try to change the way your brain works around your relationship to something else. It is definitely hard. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I say to people sometimes, I say, you know, this is a bit like, uh, I don't know, going into a Buddhist community or, or a devout Roman Catholic community, one or the other, and saying, okay, to the Buddhists, tomorrow you're all going to be Roman Catholic, and you Roman Catholics, tomorrow you're going to be Buddhist. That's it. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's changing everything. It's changing <laughs> it's cha everything. It's changing who you are, right? Like it's, But I think to your point about the power of, of, of human desire or, 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 you know, when COVID came around and we all went, ah, damn, what do we do? We changed everything because we were all on board. We're all like, no, we need to, we have to, to save people. Right. And so we changed everything in the, like at the blink of an eye, we changed it all. And it, it tells you what we can do as human beings when we really put the power and weight of people behind it, right? When everyone comes together, it's incredible how fast something that takes a long time can happen when all of a sudden the stakes are that high, right? Yeah. Well, and sometimes like this change happens a lot. Another way, um, I don't know, bike helmets. I always pick on bike helmets because right. that's a good one. I don't know if you yeah. remember, but I remember when the bike helmet room came in B BC and most people said, I piss on that. I'm not wearing bike helmets. No, nobody's going to yeah. make me wear a bike helmet. That's the <laughs> stupid, goofy, gooky looking things. <laughs> and, and the police said, we're not going to enforce that. That's like, no, not going to yeah. happen. And so nobody did it for a long time. And then, yeah, they got some fines and stuff, but nobody was, 
until they started showing the research that kids can die hitting the curb at 10 kilometers or five, six kilometers an hour. And kids are dying and people are dying. That just kept coming out more and more. And your kids won't do it if you don't do it. And next thing it starts to become okay. And then they, and then they went, well, they are geeky. Let's build some cool ones and yeah. start build some cool ones. Yeah, yeah. And next thing it's hard to find somebody who isn't wearing one. Yeah. See? I remember there's a, there's a Jerry yeah. Seinfeld joke about, about the helmet law. He, and it was something about there's, there's nothing more insane than the fact that we made, had to make a law about people, about forcing people to protect their own mind right <laughs> like it's just the fact that you have to convince your brain that it should protect itself like what are we doing because you don't want to mess your hair up like what do, what, what are we doing here how how ridiculous are we it just makes no sense yeah obviously jerry seinfeld did a much better job of telling the joke and i'm sure i butchered it but you get the core you get the no, point i get the idea no nope. yeah so but i think but it's, it's it's a good example yeah it doesn't happen just because you say it yeah. No, it takes it takes time to to make that cultural shift, but it's it is interesting. It's, it's more than interesting. It is heartening and fascinating to see that the type of conversations that we're having in the environmental community, uh, you know, sustainability community across the globe, or even in the climate change discussions and the need for shift from fossil fuels and all this stuff. The type those types of conversation that we're that we're having that we're having such a hard time you know, pushing forward and trying to, to get real progress. And you're actually starting to get some real mental traction in your, in your world and in BC, right. Which is not something to, you know, to not pay attention to. That's a, that's a huge, huge undertaking and it's a huge, huge accomplishment. And the fact that you've managed, like I said, to keep, keep the focus on for this long and to keep the progress moving in the right direction and to keep people supportive is something you should be very proud of. So I, I, yeah, thank you for that to you and everybody that's, that's, that's doing that. Cause it's, it's, it's massive and it means a lot. I think it, it's a, it's an excellent case study for other movements, right. And for the possibility. Yeah. We're not the only one in the world doing this. There's others. No. There's other countries. I've, I've had the privilege and honor of speaking to a number of other countries and jurisdictions who are going through very similar metamorphosis and just the thinking that they have to go through is not much different than the thinking that we're going through and the political right. kind of obstacles and machinations and the technical kind of how do you do it and how do you make the transition all of the things are very very similar very right. similar but it's a it's kind of like a, it's a modern day revolution right like it's it is it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's instead of the the blood and guts and and everything that required in previous revolutions we're having it's a it's an intellectual revolution right it's a it's a it's a it's a soul revolution people are starting to uh, wisdom right they're starting to they're starting to pick up on this doesn't feel quite right and you know what i'm behind this idea and it's 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 really cool to see it take shape in our lifetime when i um i don't know if you remember back in your early land management teaching when you take introduction to land management, forestry, or whatever, a lot of the early intro courses speak about the evolution of countries and the great revolt. Like Germany is often used as an example in the, it goes to late 1800s, where the whole populace said, no, we are not doing this anymore, and fundamentally changed their whole course of direction. And yeah. a number of other countries have done that. Well, French the Revolution older, is famous, right? Like, yeah. The old countries who changed their relationship to land and their whole approach and they're still changing it, but they changed dramatically at some point. Yeah. The, Europe banned the commons. They just realized that, you, and you know, that was a whole way of being. And, yeah. uh, and now they've gone back to, and they, they started replanting the entire Britain and now they've gone, Oh, well, we don't like that because it's not supporting ecosystem health and biodiversity and all of that at the landscape we're building a large so now they've gone back to we're making our whole country back to the old kind of inherent ecosystems and so yeah. they a big movement 
to do that. And they're finding that they're getting way healthier stuff everywhere. Well, these are big shifts. They're not small shifts. And they take somebody to drive them. Well, you notice one interesting thing is that older countries, some of these have done this and some are just coming into it. But all of us younger countries are just now kind of getting into it. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US, for example, are examples where this is just starting to catch on and we're starting to go, okay, yeah, we got to change. Uh, And there's a lot of countries who, for whatever reason, haven't. Like they're still, even though they're old countries, they're still young maybe and systematically managing as opposed to living with their resources. And so they're young in the sense of evolution of their economy and and that way of thinking and living with land. Their cultural identity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like in the U.S., uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, was about 25, 30 years ago. I think they made the shift or yeah. so um it was uh, they've learned a lot of things since then about ecological yeah. forestry they call it and uh, and yeah. new zealand uh, australia both have gone a long ways into it germany um, um adopted a a new way of managing basically means live with the bear um much more ecosystem based but um they have made you know, they've converted a lot of their forests to basically nice looking managed plantations. So they're uh so they're doing a lot of restoration. We got Sweden yeah. who's had volume based rotation management for three, four rotations now and they're really struggling because their forest their ecosystem just can't support that. It's turning yeah. into deserts with trees at a mass scale. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a big change. So every country is a little different and they're all kind of going, okay we, we we need to go back to this style of management if we want long term stable yeah. uh, eco- living with the land. Yeah, and the societal shift is going that way, and I think it's telling that story. And people can you can you can try and ignore it for as long as you want, but it's I feel I feel it's inevitable, right? And it's 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 really cool to see it take shape, and for me to watch it happen, and to see, and to to be able to see it happen in real time right and to recognize like this is a big moment and it's it's something to be proud of and this is great yeah 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 well yeah. thanks so much I gary have, this I was i don't have enough time to think like that <clears throat> i know <laughs> <laughs> well, th- this was this was really really great i really appreciate you taking the time to to break down the system and 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 give us your thoughts and your opinions and and you know give people the rundown of what's going on because it's uh yeah no one else could do it like you can. So thank you so much for this. Oh, you're most welcome. Yeah, it's been a, been a slice. All right, folks. That's the three-part series, I guess. It wasn't intentional, but that's the three-part series on old growth. It was good. I liked it. I was, I was happy to do this dive, and it was fun. And who better to finish it off than Gary? He just ties it all together. He's got the whole picture, and I just... I mean, you could talk to this guy for a week straight about old growth and about ecosystem-based management and about what's needed, and he could tell you so much more, <laughs> but there's only so much I could put into an hour and a half podcast. So <laughs> thank you, Gary, for all of your support, all of your time, all of your dedication towards this effort, because it's I don't think it'd be possible without, without your guidance. Uh, you and Al Gorley, obviously, Al, a huge part of this as well. So thank you, Al, for, for everything you've done as well, because you guys are a team on that one. And uh, yeah, I hope you like it. We'll catch you all next time. Take it easy.